language term, or use the term, and that's us. It's more kind of internationally used, um, but it's really essentially personal budgets that we're talking about. So over the last um, three years, when I've been doing my work, there have been three uh, terms that I've come across being used here in Ireland. The first, direct payment, and as the name suggests there, a direct payment is an amount of money that is provided directly to the individual so that they and their support network can decide how that money gets spent to meet their needs. Um, the, another term that I came across was independent support broker, and similarly there is an amount of money that's allocated to an individual, but in this case the broker actually looks after all of the paperwork and the admin that goes with um, with a, an individualised budget, um, whereas with the direct payment, the individual generally will look after all the paperwork themselves, although the, there can be supports there in place if uh, required as well. Another term was self-managed model, using a community connector, and essentially that's kind of like a combination of the two, the direct <coughs> payment, uh, with, but also with a support broker in place there, and that's more of an, a term that would have come from the Australian model. So these terms here um, would be what you might recognise from the UK, so individual budget, recovery budget, microboard, notional budget, there's various different terms there that, that uh, would be used in the UK as well as the ones that we've adopted here in Ireland. Uh, in the US, cash and counselling, consumer directed care, self-determination programme, again similar terms and uh, Finally, I'll just pop up here, there's a whole other range of terms that are used in other places like Australia, the Netherlands, and any other country that's doing it. But essentially, all of these terms really mean the same thing. And what it boils down to is uh, individualised funding, and that's all about giving the individual with a disability more choice and control over their lives, and giving them independence, allowing them to live a self-determined life, and empowering them to make those choices uh, as to how they meet their needs. Um, so an individualised uh, funding can be for anybody with a physical, sensory, intellectual disability, uh, people with mental health issues and even dementia in, in some places as well. So I just want to briefly mention what the alternative looks like and what the current situation really is here in Ireland. So as Pat mentioned, the majority of funding gets uh, spent in two ways. The first is residential services. And as you, I'm sure you're aware, what that essentially means is for the person lives, where they eat, sleep, and have any of their health needs met if necessary. And generally, these are group-based. In the past, there would have been institutions, large institutions. Nowadays, they're generally more uh, group-based homes and, and, to a lesser degree, some independent living facilities. And then the other would be day services. And generally, these are a set calendar of activities. <coughs> generally, be the same activities on the same day of the week same time every week and again it would be group based and uh, I guess the, the point I'm making here is that they're generally group based, they're in a, in, in a group setting and it's very difficult to individualise the services for one individual when you're trying to accommodate a larger group. So just moving back to individualised funding and what we mean by that. So it's, it's actually very simple, the message. It's allowing the individual with a disability to determine what it is that they need in their life to have a full life, um, just like anybody else within the community. It means that they can decide where they purchase the services that they need or any of the activities that they want in order to have a full and healthy life. They get to decide when they purchase those services, so not on a Monday, this is what's available and you have to choose from a, a set of options or maybe there are no options, it's just this is what's happening on Monday. But you get to decide whether you need these things on a Monday or a Tuesday or whatever the case may be. Also the individual gets to decide how those um, needs are met and that varies for, you know, there's a thousand different ways to achieve the same goal and, and it depends on how the individual wants to go about that. And finally they get to decide who delivers those services um, rather than being told this, this, these are the people that are going to deliver these services. So just wanted to run through a few of the things that I would, from my experience, talk to family members and staff that were implementing the pilot projects. A few of the things that I would say individualised funding reflects, and that would be that uh, it's flexible, it's person-led, it's needs-led, it is doable despite what we might hear and, and, and the lack of uh, rollout across the country, it is doable. 
Uh, individualized funding is adaptable. It can change, you know, if something's not working, you have the flexibility to say, actually, you know what, let's try something else. Whereas you don't necessarily have that if you have a limited uh, choice of services available to you. Uh, individualized funding is challenging without a doubt, and especially when we don't have uh, systems set up in place for resource allocation, and just basically getting access to the money is probably one of the biggest challenges at the moment. So it is challenging, but having said that, uh, if you manage to get through that initial challenging phase, it's definitely very rewarding. From what I've heard speaking to the, the people with disabilities that have been part of those pilot projects here in Ireland and their uh, support networks. And I would definitely say that individualised funding in Ireland is, is certainly challenging the status quo. Things that uh, individualised funding is not, uh, in my opinion, uh, they're not replacing existing services. I mean, the existing services are going to still be there. There's no way that they couldn't be. And essentially, someone who has an individualized uh, budget could decide, you know what, I actually want to go to the, the day services for two days a week or three days a week. But it's about having the option to say, yeah, I'll go there for two days and I'll use the rest of the money for other things that I need to, to fulfill my life. And um, they're not replacing staff. I mean, the staff is still going to be there. And even if individualized funding did get rolled out and there wasn't so much need for day services, the staff would be required to fill the new positions that would become available potentially. Um, there's a lot of talk about individualized funding increasing risk, and I don't necessarily think that's the case, especially if, the, if you have the right supports in place and that uh, these things are being implemented correctly. Uh, it's not purely a cost-saving measure. Uh, I kind of got that message a few times myself. Um, there is definitely potential for value for money. You can get things uh, a lot cheaper if, uh, if you're not tied into contracts that have been there for a long time. You're able to shop around when you've got your individualized funding. And as Pat also said, uh, one size doesn't fit all. So you're not going to get one individualized budget that one person has that you'd be able to roll out across the board because it doesn't work like that. It's based on the individual. Um, I just wanted to run through kind of you know where did this where did it all start and I suppose really it's rooted in the independent living movement, um, whereby uh, people with disability were able to um, get personal assistant hours to live an independent life and I suppose it's moving up beyond that and, and having complete control over their life, not just uh, purchasing personal assistant hours because while one person might need personal assistant hours, uh, another might actually want to not have a personal assistant and to really try and develop their independent life skills and just be able to buy the materials or say the kitchen equipment for cooking safely and that sort of stuff um, and also have maybe fewer uh, personal assistant hours. So it's, it's all about having that flexibility to decide what best suits your needs. Um, it's about emphasising choice and control and acknowledging also that you know personal budgets aren't the only way but you know it would be great to have that option available here in Ireland. Um, I skipped the first point there just to mention that you know the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities did recognise and did uh, highlight that uh, personal bridges were a way of um, gaining self determination for people with a, a disability. Um, and ultimately, it's about putting the, the person at the centre of this decision making process and recognising their strengths and their pref preferences and empowering them to shape all of the services that they require, as I said, to, to lead a full life. Um, I just wanted to mention very quickly my own research that I'm that I'm doing. So I looked at I looked back on day services over a 15 year period to see, you know, what did that look like? Um, were people's uh, needs being met when they said, look, I'd like this? And did the services kind of respond appropriately? Um, the second piece there is the evaluation of the four pilot projects. And two of those are no longer pilots, they're actually um, still running and they're trying to integrate with, into the kind of mainstream system. Um, and just on Friday, actually, the initial results from that evaluation were published and they're available on the GENIO website at that address there. And there's also a few copies outside on the table, um, it's just this report here. And essentially, um, it's the voices of the people with disabilities that I was speaking to and their support networks and the staff that were implementing those four pilots and about the challenges and the successes of implementing those in Ireland, particularly within the Irish context. So it's not looking at the international situation, it's very much looking at Ireland. And then the final point there is, I'm trying to pull together all of the evidence from around the world and put it all together into one report, basically to see if you know personalised budgets do uh, improve the health and social care outcomes for people with a disability. 
I mean, there's a lot of evidence to say that there is, but it's just about pulling it all together and making it uh, stronger and more robust. So I'm almost finished. I just want to leave you with a quote from one of the staff members that I spoke to. And this actually, just to give you a bit of background, this staff member came in and he, he felt he knew exactly what this personal budget initiative was all about. Um, and he felt that that meant getting more personal assistant hours for the person when he was all going home. But he realised through the process of working with individuals that it was more than that, it was deeper. It was about uh, developing that person's skills so that they could be able to identify what it was that they needed to get to that final goal, whatever their goal was, and kind of working through the process of, of um, how to make that choice and how to be able to identify those choices. So I'll just read through this quote here, and I think it's just, I, he put it very nicely. He said, traditionally we've had a porridge society, a porridge menu, so we've fed porridge all our lives to individuals, and then we give them an a la carte menu and say, what do you want? And they say, I'll have porridge. You know, that's not choice, but by finding out an individual what they actually want to be doing with their life, and funding them accordingly, that's essentially what it's all about. So, thank you very much.